Guten Tag, Stockholm. It's nice to be here at the J-Focus Conference. Hey! Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our talk. Uh, which talk do we give today? Ah, pushing deep fakes to the limit, fake video calls with AI. And um, typically, we start our talk with introducing ourselves, but not today. Today, we make an experiment with uh, a famous popular scientist of Germany, of Harald Lesch. Let's have a look to this one. Guten Abend zusammen. Willkommen bei Lesch Cosmos. Unser Thema heute Deep Fakes. Eine Technologie, mit der man praktisch jeden alles sagen lassen kann. Und zwar in Echtzeit. Das klappt ja wunderbar. Da kann ja, mit dieser Technik kann ja jeder eine Wissenschaftssendung moderieren. Sogar du. Ich und eine Wissenschaftssendung? Was für eine absurde <lacht> Idee. Aber wenn meine Stimme da nicht wäre, dann könnte man mich wirklich für dich halten. Und überleg mal, wenn man das woanders einsetzt, dann kann man damit ja eine völlig neue Dimension von Fake News schaffen. Und das macht mir echt Sorgen. Die Möglichkeiten zu manipulieren sind damit ja schier unendlich. Ja, man könnte zum Beispiel irgendeiner Politikerin oder einem Politiker irgendwas in den Mund legen. Also was ganz Fieses. Und eine andere Regierung nimmt das dann ernst und drückt vielleicht auf den roten Knopf. Wie so oft waren andere schneller als du und haben genau das gemacht. Yeah, somebody did just that. So who knew the last clip that we just showed you? Hands up quick. A couple of people know it. So what you just saw, the last clip was a deepfake video that surfaced on the internet like last spring. And it shows President Zelensky from the Ukraine basically telling his people to give up and lay their arms down and surrender to Russia. And this, of course, is a deepfake video that, yeah, just kind of appeared on the internet. We don't know who did it. We had nothing to do with it. And we have to also say we're not fans of the context or the, just, just how the, the, the way that it was made. But it kind of goes to show why what we're talking about today is important, because we have kind of the same view as Carl Beckstrom, who says, well, when a new technology like this comes along, the most dangerous time is when it's out there and that, well, the public is not aware of it. That's when it can be used most effectively. So that's what we kind of want to do today. We want to explain to you what exactly a deepfake is, what you can do with a deepfake so that when you see a video like this, you might think to yourself, maybe this is not President Zelensky. All right. Yeah. So now we can start with our introduction. Yeah. So, yeah, my name is Martin Furch. I am a principal consultant at TNG Technology Consulting, and it's a yeah, IT consulting company based in Munich. And we have 750 employees right now. And uh, back in the days, Thomas and me, we started something in the company which is called the Innovation Hacking Team. So we are working on innovative stuff. So Thomas Andrus, maybe you want to add yeah, something? So my name is Thomas Andrus. I studied computer sciences as well. And after my studies, I joined TNG. And together with Martin, we've been working on VR, AR, AI, gesture control showcases, everything that's innovative, that's new, that's our stuff, I would say. All right, Jonas. Yeah, and my name is Jonas. You can see I have just a nice, uh, just <laughs> as nice of a photo as the other two guys. And um, so I'm a senior consultant at TNG Technology Consulting. Uh, I do a bunch of stuff. Well, mostly I work in the innovation hacking team that Thomas and Martin just des uh, described. And I work on beautiful projects like, for example, the real-time deepfakes. But with that out of the way, let's take it away and talk about quickly the evolution of deepfakes, yeah. Martin. Yeah, let's talk about the story and the evolution of deepfakes. It started back in the days uh, on a forum named uh, yeah, Reddit and uh, a person named Deepfaker just published some kind of videos uh, where he replaced uh, yeah, the heads in the, uh, in the movie snippet with uh, his yeah, famous actress and transferred that uh, to another um, movie genre. And uh, yeah, so uh, Wise Motherboard came along and uh, they published this headline in 2018 and they said AI assisted fake porn is here and we're all f yeah. so yeah it was in autumn 2018 something and uh, there was a software published named deep face lab and with this those deep fakes were created and uh, it had the following features so um, you can take a video and you can do some kind of face replacement not the whole head but the face um, 
it has a post-video processing approach. So you need some source material, you need uh, material of the person you want to fake into the video, and you have to po process that afterwards, um, after you train the neural networks. It has a very wide distribution, so you can say that up to 90 plus percent of all generated, created deepfakes are done with this stuff here. And yeah, it's open source. So Haoli, Professor Haoli said, perfectly real deepfakes. They will coming soon in 12 months or something. He said that in 2019 and we thought, well, challenge accepted. So we started to work on real-time deepfakes. And you might ask, what was the motivation behind that? Let's have a look. We called it Deepfakes 2.0, and our yeah, first idea was, or motivation, it should work with any face. So you just stand in front of a camera, you get filmed, and something happens. It's not only the face we want to replace, we want to replace the whole head. And this should happen in ludicrous speed, so in real time. This was the idea, and if you have a look to the original implementation of Deep Face Lab, yeah, uh, ah, I heard it here, yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, we wanted to have it some clean code. <laughs> so, Jonas, the question now is, why? Yeah, why, why do we care about Deep Fakes? Why does our company care about us doing Deep Fakes? And that's a very good question, and I'm glad that nobody asked that, because we're going to answer it right now. So, there's a bunch of reasons why our company wants us to do innovative projects like this. And the first one is because it's fun. You can see here two people enjoying deep fakes. It's not only fun for them, but also for the consultants that are working on projects like these. Um, yeah, just a nice treat for everyone involved. And then the second, a little bit more serious topic is, well, it's the learning experience. Like fun projects like these, they are a great opportunity to learn. Because you see, the bread and butter of TNG technology consulting is not making deep fakes. We do uh, specialized or individual software solutions for customers. But the thing is, we want to keep our consultants at the cutting edge of technology. And what a better way to learn than to play around with fun projects like real-time deepfakes and learn very important skills for the future, such as, well, neural networks for computer vision. And the idea here is basically that whenever a customer approaches us and they want to do an AI project, we already have the skill set for that. And then the third very important reason is, well, we want to spread the word. And this is kind of meta here. Um, but yeah, like traveling to conferences and giving talks is fun and all, but our company also has a genuine interest of spreading the word that we actually are able to do this. So if you find yourself in the audience, you're looking for a nice new job where you can work on deep fakes, or if you need a new contractor for your next AI project, well, feel free to contact us after the talk. But that's the advertisement section out of the way. <laughs> Thank you to today's sponsor. And, um, yeah, now, Martin, let's go how back did the, to the evolution right now after the advertisement block. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, there was a lot uh, uh, going on in the news. So uh, Heiser Online Game Star, the German television, uh, they made some issues about our deepfake stuff. And uh, yeah, so we started to make it much better with the deepfakes 2.1 implementation. And this is what we want to talk about today. Um, how we realized that and how the evolution um, in our pro project started here. So, Thomas, I think now is a good time to tell the audience how deepfakes generally work. Yeah, exactly. And now let's have a look at the core of the deepfakes. And this is our so-called autoencoder. So here in the picture we have uh, such an autoencoder. What we have here is an image on the left and an image on the right. And in between we have a neural network. And now given an image, the neural network should reproduce exactly the same image. But it does that through a bottleneck in the middle. So in the middle we have a so-called latent space. And uh, there we have um, some, um, yeah, um, some form of representation that is um, somehow uh, where we have less information. And we can break that down from the original image to the latent space representation using the encoder. And then we use a decoder to get the latent space representation back into the original image. And this is a decoder. And if we start 
by just uh, using uh, an untrained neural network, then we will, of course, get some white noise at the beginning. So what we have to do now is we have to train our neural network. So this is what happens now. Uh, we can just do a pixel-wise comparison of the picture on the right with the picture on the left. And with that, we calculate a loss. And this is used to train the neural network to reproduce the image on the left and uh, reproduce it perfectly. Okay, and with that, we can now <laughs> reproduce the same image, but this is kind of boring because it does basically nothing. But the trick is if we use two of these autoencoders using a uh, common encoder in the middle. Uh, yeah, a common encoder. And if we do this, we can just take the image of, in this case, Harald Lesch, the guy in, uh, on top, and then put it through our encoder into the put it into the latent space representation and then use the wrong decoder namely that of Dirk Steffens and with that we can then reproduce the face of Dirk Steffens but with the facial expression of Harald Lesch and this is basically how a deep work fake works yeah and inside the latent space representation, we have something like features, is, are the eyes open, the mouth open, and so on, and so yeah. on. That's what we guess, but the neural network will, of course, uh, yeah. just learn that by itself. Yeah. So, and this brings us now to the real-time deepfakes. Yeah, and let's have a look, because uh, we don't just need an autoencoder, we need a few other steps in front of that uh, to really calculate our deepfake video. So first of all, of course, we need a camera and we need to grab the image from the camera. The second step is then we need to find out uh, where the face is located. So we need a face detection. And for that, now we are in the sphere of uh, deepfakes 2.0. So what we did there was basically just use an off-the-shelf neural network for face detection, which we could just use on the CPU using the OpenCV computer vision library. And with that, we had a face detection which was fast enough, could be done in real time with multiple faces, even if someone was covering their uh, face with a hand or something like that, even if someone was looking sideways, everything worked perfectly. And this was fast enough for us and good enough for us, so we could just continue with that. So next step then is to um, deduct every pixel that belongs to the face. So we need to find out which pixels are in the face and which pixels are outside of the face within this area that we just identified as a face tracked area. And with that, we can now um, use another neural network to do exactly this. And here's a demo of that. So as you can see, it works pretty well. Every pixel that is bluish now belongs to um, yeah, <laughs> Jonas's face and every pixel that is uh, somehow normal doesn't belong there. And as you can see, it's not perfect. It's not really perfect. So if Jonas looks sideways, it will break the illusion somehow. But uh, this is also due to the fact that, uh, of which um, training material you used. But we'll get to that in a second. So let's have a look at how this works. In fact, face detection was basically just an off-the-shelf neural network that we used. For face segmentation, we didn't have that luxury, so we needed to come up with our own implementation here. And here we use a technique um, which, is, which we used in several projects already. So we use two different neural networks here. The first one is a so-called mobile net. Mobile net is a fast neural network, so that's good but it is used normally for classification, so it can tell whether a cat is a cat or a dog is a dog or something like that. So what we do now is we just cut away the last layers of the mobile net and just put another neural network, a so-called UNet, um, um, at the last point of it and uh, just cut them together uh, and glue them together. And with that, we can then do some um, segmentation. You could also use a pure unit to do segmentation, but the advantage of this approach is that we, the mobile net already knows a lot about the world. So it already knows what a cat is, what a dog is, and many other things. So when we now give the neural network a task to really um, I, uh, to, to identify each pixel that belongs to the face, we can now already built on that knowledge that MobileNet has. 
and we can then use just a few thousand training images and just train the UNet. And this is also called transfer learning. Coming to data, uh, speaking about data, let's have a look at the data set that we used for the Deepfakes 2.0 implementation. This is Celeb A Mask HQ. It's a data set of celebrities. And as you can see on the left side, there's the original image. And on the right side, we have a hand segmented image. So there was one guy who was really um, drawing each of these um, planes here. And you can see this, uh, he segmented out the head something like the eyes, uh, the hair, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we can then just take um, the whole area that belongs to the face and use that for our segmentation, um, for our neural segmentation. And as you can see here, this is also, you, uh, the, uh, this is also the reason why um, the, uh, why we had some problems when Jonas was looking sideways because celebrities really don't like looking sideways into the camera. All right, so with that out of the way, now the next step is we need to do some, uh, we need to erase the old face, so we need to do some so-called in-painting, which is basically just removing some pixels out of the image and filling <laughs> the void with something else. So Jonas looks way better now. <laughs> with, with all his face gone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is a technique which um, is found in, um, in uh, image um, editing. Uh, so, so if you have a look at f uh, Photoshop, then we'll have something, uh, also a technique called, uh, called in-painting. And this is, it just fills the pixels of scratches with the surrounding pixels. And uh, we can do this as well with, uh, with uh, OpenCV, the computer vision library. And with that, we had the original face erased. And next up, we would now come to the final stage. And this is, of course, the autoencoder. And now we need to replace the original face. So exactly. Jonas. Exactly. So now we have cut off the face. And now we can just replace it with Putin. And this is not such a good idea. The slides that didn't age too well. So we're now going to instead replace the head with King Marcus of Bavaria, for those <laughs> who are familiar. So how do we do that now? Because we still have the goals. We want to do this for the entire head and also do this in real time. So our idea was, well, and also we want any person to be able to instant, uh, stand in front of the camera and still be deep faked. So our idea is to basically do this. Um, so instead of just training two outer encoders, let's just train n on n different faces. So this means during training, the encoder sees well quite a lot of faces. And what the encoder tends to do when it sees a lot of stuff is to generalize. So it is now able to, whoever stands in front of the camera, well, compress his or her face down into that latent space representation that the decoders can then decode to a full face again. And then also a second change that we do is we put in now the entire face, uh, the, the entire head instead of just the facial area. And then we also take the original network and we just slim it down a little bit. And we thought, well, this is all great and good. And then we started training and we got some very interesting results. So this is supposed to be a deep fake of Martin. Um, I'm sure you might see Martin doesn't have an eye on his forehead, so that's the problem. Um, then we also have things like uh, Picasso paintings. Um, we started this project earlier there when, when Trump still was a, th was a thing and he had a, a mouth on his forehead, quite <laughs> fittingly. And then, of course, we have Man Bear Pig and uh, Alien Head Obama. So obviously something is going wrong as soon as we start putting in a different face to actually do the deep fake. So, we changed so much about the training system, we figured that, well, we somehow have to help the autoencoder now to kind of still make sure that whatever comes out looks like a human being and not, not like whatever this is. So what we decided to do is we decided to reinforce the training with so-called a gun, uh, so-called gun training approach. And a gun training, that is basically a fight. We add in another new network and they will fight. It's the fight of the generator against the discriminator. Fight! 
Yeah, so what we're going to do now is we're going to fight live here on stage because we're going to LARP how a gun works. And because we're nerds, we're not going to fight like physically. We're just going to do it like on a keyboard kind of thing. Um, okay, why is this full screen? Let's see. Okay, I can either have both or none. That's very good to know. Uh, hang on. Command shift. Okay, control shift. Okay, that doesn't work. Nope. Hmm? Control tab. That works. All right, so the game is the following. We have a beautiful face here on uh, the left, and we have to so nice. distribute the roles. Um, so we have two parties in this game. Uh, one is the generator. We're just going to call our autoencoder the generator from now on. And yeah, Martin, you're pretty good at generating, right? Because he has two kids. Um, so <laughs> you're going to be the generator. And um, then for no particular reason whatsoever, the other person is called the discriminator, and I think Thomas is going to do a great job at doing that. Um, so the roles are the following. So you as the generator, Martin, yes. you see this face here on the left. You've seen a face before, right? Uh, no, I'm a new, newly initialized uh, deep neural network. I have never seen something like a face. So my weights and biases, they are just, you know, Well, as randomized. a matter of fact, we're in the early training, Martin. You have seen them a couple of times. Okay. So you roughly know what a face is, and your objective ah, is okay. now to take that face over here. Okay. You have to compress it, right, uh -huh. and then reproduce it again. Just draw mm -hmm. it for us. So I already, okay, I see. Yeah, right. So that's your objective right here. So what should I do? Yeah, Thomas, you are the discriminator, right? Yeah. As soon as Martin is finished drawing, and it's important that you don't look what Martin is drawing, because you then have to guess which one is the real face and which one is the one that huh. Martin drew. All right. So I that's do that. your objective, okay. Thomas. So Martin is going to start. Martin, okay. Okay. Uh, just 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 start drawing. And mind, there's an offset in the mouse thing. Oh no! So and I have Thomas, to you're just okay. going to yeah, exactly. Do whatever uh, you're doing. Okay, let's go. Uh, yeah, looking good. Okay, no, 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 no. Let's let's start over. I we, hate we this offset here. So that's we, we, we have time. We have time. Like an actual neural network does this within like a couple of milliseconds. You're good, Martin. Oh my god. Okay, cool. This looks like uh, this kind of resembles drawing with the offset. Oh my god. It's <laughs> yeah, uh, the fun thing is because we had to make it harder for him. So oh. Thomas wrote this entire drawing engine here and he put in like an offset of the mouse. So Okay. Yeah. Okay, you're you're finished? I, I think I finished, yeah. I'm finished. Um Okay. <laughs> that is very nice. Thomas. Thomas, hey. It's your turn. Uh, Wake up. Um, so, <laughs> okay. here <laughs> so here you have two images of a face, right? Yeah. You've seen faces before, right? A few. A few. Yeah, yeah. not not a lot. Yeah, no, but not too many. Yeah. Okay, so one of them is real and one of them is fake. And you okay. now have to tell us which one is real, which one is fake. Ooh, so, so so Martin drew a few faces before. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, this. Seems like this one is one of the better ones. Mm. Yeah, it's not that easy, is <laughs> it? Um, I would. Poo. This is pretty hard because I've not that's uh, not seen that many faces before. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, within the previous images that I've seen, the real ones were always colorful, and the right one is lacking color. Okay. Although, yeah, I would say on the right. Side, uh, everything's there. So there are eyes, there are, there's a mouth, and so on and so on. So mm -hmm. the right one is pretty good, but I still think the left one is the real one. Okay, let's see if you're right, and we're gonna. Yes, that one is the correct one. Um, so you win, Martin. Martin, did you listen? What Thomas just yes. said. Yes. Okay, yes. that's yes. very good. That's very good. There was something with color and stuff like color that. Color and yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 you got some see, feedback see, see, from see. Thomas because uh, you listened, and now you have to. Make ah. that work okay. in our next round. Yeah. So I did thousands of iterations of training. Yeah, we're going to skip ahead in the training a little bit. Thomas is just going to yeah, go, go back <laughs> to sleep. And Martin is now going to be full send on his drawing skills. Uh, he's learned a bit like how his face looks, how colors work. And he's now able to draw with a flesh paintbrush. Um, Looking good. <laughs> so we definitely have some color in there. So that's what he learned from, from the last couple of rounds, that color is definitely something that the discriminator uses to detect a real or a fake face. Now the problem is to set eyes with the offset. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're doing fine. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, some beautiful white eyes in there. Uh, 
it even adds like the eyebrows in there automatically. Oh, that's fantastic. And you can see down there we get like a hint of shoulder. So that's very good. And now a big grin. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> okay, that looks. That I looks, think that's fine. That looks fantastic. <laughs> All right, yeah. Let's see what Thomas has to say about this because it's not that simple. Thomas, hey. Hmm? Wake up. Ah. Yeah, so this one I know is going to be pretty tough, <laughs> uh, but you'll have to tell us which one is the real one, which one is the fake one. Wow, that's, that's <laughs> really tough. So oh, I can't really distinguish between these two. They are exactly identical. So I can see eyes on both of them. There's a nose. There's this beautiful smile. and. Whew. Yeah, so there's no way you can tell. That I, ca I, ca I cannot tell them apart. Yeah. Sorry, I'm. Uh, I think we're finished with training here. Yeah, but just just to be sure, this one for the audience, this one was the real one. Um, and now we've reached what is called an equilibrium. So the discriminator can tell anymore what is real and what is fake. So just like you. <laughs> and uh, now also the generator has learned to make a pretty good face, and that is how the GAN do. So let's have a look at this. Uh, well quick schematic of how this works. So remember, we have the data set of real faces. Then we also have the generator that generates the fake faces. And we feed both of those into the discriminator, which has the job to distinguish between real and fake. And it, it trains and it learns during training how the real and fake ones look like. And at the same time, it provides feedback in form of a loss function to the generator. So the generator now tries to generate faces that look real to the discriminator. So we have this kind of interesting cyclic dependency, like a zero-sum game. They both start from nothing, know nothing about faces. It's all in the data, and they just pick it up on their own. And once we apply this beautiful GAN training, Martin, why won't you step in here? Um, then we can now do beautifully photorealistic real-time deepfakes of myself. <laughs> yeah. Let me try that, Martin. <laughs> yeah. You can see there's a couple of issues. And not, not all of them come from the fact that we're running <laughs> this on a Mac right now. Uh, what we can also do is we can just switch through the faces so you don't have to look like me like three years ago. Uh, but now you can look like somebody else who has like a horribly distorted face. <laughs> Um, let's, yeah, let's, let's see, see what you are seeing. Let's see a couple of other faces. Um, yeah, you can also be a woman if you want to, um, or an old person. So um, it kind of works for every single person. It kind of runs in real time. And that, well, the fact that we are running two FPS, let that not confuse you. Um, it's mostly due to the fact that we're running off a laptop because our computer broke on the way here. <laughs> so, yeah, kind of real time, kind of looks good, but we still have some problems, don't we, Martin? Yes, we have a lot of problems. And uh, so this is one of the very, very first uh, yeah, uh, created real-time deepfakes. It was in 2019, right? 2019, yeah. Uh, tw yeah, 2019. And uh, let's have a look to this one. So this is uh, me as Obama. And uh, let's have a look. So the skin details, for example, everything looks kind of blurry. And uh, if I'm just smiling, it's distorted somehow. And uh, it's very easy to spot that as a deep fake. And uh, thankfully, Obama has a bald like me. But uh, what happens uh, if I have someone with full hair, like here? Then you can see that uh, the hair of uh, the orange guy just gets projected onto my bald, which also doesn't look very naturally. And uh, also when it comes to some uh, mimics, it's really hard for the neural network to generate a good looking yeah, um, deep fake. So we had the idea, okay, we can assist the deep neural network. We can help the deep neural network just by wearing it to pay. So the idea from the German television was uh, that we want to create deep fakes of uh, Albert Einstein. And you can see that this trick still didn't work really good, but this is also due to the fact that there is nearly no existing motion picture of Albert Einstein. Yeah, and that is a big problem. Yeah, and this brings us to pushing deepfakes to the limit right now. Yeah, because 
Yeah, we, we were thinking kind of back to the drawing board. We had kind of achieved what we wanted, but we wanted to take it a step further. And so far, all of our training was written in um, um, w using a package that is called Keras for Python that allows you to do some very simple things with neural networks, but it doesn't really work for the more complex stuff, so we wanted to go to somewhere else. And just at that time, it, was, it, it happened that TensorFlow 2 was released. And the cool thing is that, well, TensorFlow is in a very loving relationship with Keras. So they're kind of that annoying couple that only ever show up at parties together and they, they leave at the same time. So what this means is, and you can also see that in this very nice representation here, Keras is more of like the high level API up there for like your very simple tasks. And if you want to get down and do like dirty gun stuff, you can use TensorFlow for that. And this was very handy for us because we could simply reuse um, what uh, we had for, for um, the neural networks, the encoders, the decoders, the discriminators. All of that code we could reuse simply for Keras. Uh, same thing goes for the losses. But then we could also rewrite an entire new training pipeline, uh, use tensor board functionality, use optimizers, a data loader, and all of that to get like a real good training. Uh, just one quick thing about the data loader. Um, so the way that this works, basically, it, it's uh, it's a system that allows you to stream data from your hard drive at real time, so you don't have to have the entire data set in memory, which allowed us to use way bigger and way, um, way larger data sets, which was fun. And then what that led to was that allowed us to build a very modular training pipeline where we could easily play around with different kinds of GAN scenarios using multiple discriminators, using different kinds of loss function, and quickly tweaking what makes a deep fake good. And you can see a result of that, a first result here. So on the left side, you can see the input. On the middle, you can see the first deep fake implementation. And on the right, you can see the new revised trainer version. And while we have a lot more details on the, on the right, um, so the hair does work, for example, we have a, no a lot better wrinkles, we have a higher resolution in general, there's still some problems there. You still have like some distortions here in the face. It doesn't really look that natural. Something is still going on here. So let's have a look at that. So for the sake of this example, let's assume that I want to turn myself into Mr. Balloon Man here. So th that's his <laughs> face. That's my face. And now we do one of our old deep fakes of Xi Jinping onto my face. And it looks something like this. And you can see, well, it's kind of works, but it's not really what you're expecting. Like the face shape is way off. So what's going on here? Let's have a look at the data that we have. So here's an uh, example of Xi Jinping. Here we have another famous barbarian politician. And one thing that you might notice is the eyes are always at a different location. And if we take, for example, an image of Merkel or of King Marcus, you can see the face is way shifted to the left because what we have right now is just a face detector that gives us a rough estimate of where the face is and we have no real uh, capability to center that face every single time. So what the neural network essentially learns is, if we want to turn Angela Merkel into Trump for some reason, <laughs> um, it basically learns to identify, okay, where are all the different parts of the face? And now it's gonna do what we call, well, a deep fake makeup thing. So it's just gonna paint the skin with Trump makeup, and then we end up with something like this. And then it's just going to repaint the eyes and the nose and the mouth and the hair with Trump makeup. And we have an abomination that looks like this. And um, kind of with the face shape of Ang Angela Merkel, but kind of also with just like the skin tones of Donald Trump. And that's an issue that we have to solve. We need a new face detector here. And the other issue that you just saw was, well, we kind of had good-ish performance if we didn't have like three people standing in there. But still, we, we could improve on that. So we had a missing piece. We needed a new face detector. We needed a new inference pipeline as well. And that missing piece was MediaPipe, Thomas. Yeah, and in 2021, we found a new library called MediaPipe. MediaPipe is basically an image streaming library, so you can use it on your camera input. And it is basically a ready-to-use solution, so you can use it out of the box. Um, it is, you can use it basically everywhere, be it a computer, a smartphone, be it a Python script, a JavaScript um, website, or and so on and so on and so on. It is accelerated, so it's very fast, even on 
uh, lightweight devices and it's also free and open source so you can use it also for commercial projects. And the one thing we were interested in here is this one and this is face mesh. And with face mesh we detect all these landmarks in the face and uh, this is exactly what we needed for our deepfake implementation. And what we use here is a new face detector called uh, Blaze Face, which uh, face mesh is based upon. And this is a pretty fast um, face detector. And with this, once we have done the face detection, we can then do these beautiful landmarks and match them onto the face. There are 468 of those. And it's even fascinating because we can also not just do a 2D representation, within the camera image, but actually a 3D representation. So it will really guess the 3D positions within the face. And with this, we can basically reconstruct the face. There are also some other neat features that come with face mesh. One of them being that it is um, yeah, temporal consistent. So even if you put your hand in front of your uh, head, it will still remember where these uh, things, uh, where the landmark points were, so it will not distort them too much um, if, you, if it has seen your face before. And it's also, it's basically working really for every person because it was trained with basically every human on Earth. So every ethnicity is uh, in the data set. Um, you can put a child in front of the camera, but you can also put an old person and uh, that's, uh, that's the beauty of it. So um, with that out of the way, now we have a demo showcasing how this all uh, works together. And this so is where I have to step in because you have to press two buttons, which is too much work yeah. uh, for Thomas. <laughs> yeah, I cannot do this, sorry. Uh, yeah, so and here you, you can see now my face and you can see the 468 landmark points. And as you can see, works pretty neat. And this is exactly what we needed for the two deepfakes 2.1 implementation. Yeah. And now we have the last missing piece. We have something that gives us, well, the facial landmarks that we can then use to kind of cut out the face centrally and always align it so that the eyes point upwards and stuff like that. And let's do that. Let's build a new inference pipeline. Once again, we're going to start with um, just the raw image that comes in from the camera. Then we're going to run face mesh on top of that. And that gives us uh, an axis aligned bounding box of the face. And with that information, we can now take that, toss that onto the GPU, and run all of those three steps that we do here, transferring the person into King Marcus, uh, in one long pipeline that runs entirely in TensorFlow, and therefore it is very, very quick. So let's have a look at how exactly this looks. We now have an, uh, yet another very well-aged example uh, of us turning Harald Lesch into Vladimir Putin. And you can see on the left, that's the raw input. In the middle, you have um, the face mesh. And then on the right, we have the deepfake. And all of those weird twitchiness and distortion artifacts that we had previously, they are kind of gone. This actually looks like Vladimir Putin if he was really in the studio talking about deepfakes. And that is pretty great because now what we can do is we can simply look at some real-time deepfakes that run with two frames per second on a MacBook. Um, and who am I right now? Ah, well, I'm a person that... I'm an Abdallah from Pro7. Okay, yeah. So those of you watching German television might be familiar with them. Uh, who am I now? Uh, Dirk Steffens. Dirk Steffens. Okay, so I'm the other guy that you saw just previously. And uh, is, is the face working all right? Can I boast? Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, it's, okay, that's yeah, okay. Good. Yeah. Okay, we don't have the distortions working anymore. Well. And on a proper PC, this runs like a charm. Let's check another few faces. Who am I oh, now? I know this guy. This is Haru Füllgrabe. Haru Füllgrabe. Who? Hey, there was something with that Haru guy. Füllgrabe. Haru yeah, Füllgrabe. We, we're going to talk about that later. And yeah. let's do one more face. Oh, that's me. No, let's skip that one. Um, who's this? Yeah. Harald Lesch. Harald Lesch again. Okay. So you can see we have perfectly working deepfakes. We don't reuse the face shape anymore. And the thing is, you could now ask yourself if this wasn't running on a MacBook, yeah. if this was running on like an actual um, good machine running in real time, could you use this to fool somebody in video calls? And that's exactly what we want to but talk if about. If you say uh, right machine now. which is good enough, maybe we can tell the audience. Uh, yeah, we had, the requirements we, have. we had like a nice little suitcase PC that was pretty much just a really baller uh, desktop PC in a suitcase and it broke on the way here. Yeah, with like a 3090 
and yeah, it's, yeah. it's a shame. So, <clears throat> now we want to start with the part, the cybersecurity part right now. It's a video calls with deep fakes. So let's have a look. So Pro7 Galileo, it's a TV magazine in Germany. And um, yeah, so let's have a look to these uh, two guys. Um, the one is Haru Füllgrabe and the other one is Matthias Fiedler. Why do I tell you? Because we made an experiment. And let's have a look to the setup of this experiment. So Haru Füllgrabe was uh, sitting in front of a PC with a webcam and he gets filmed by a DSLR camera. The DSLR camera signal goes into our real-time deepfake computer and uh, is faking the video stream and then we put that back into the Zoom meeting. And uh, there he appears as Matthias Fiedler, the bald guy, okay? Hello, Let's have a look to this one. Du glaubst gar nicht, was hier alles los ist. Die Leitung stimmt nicht, dann geht das in die Hose und das geht in die Hose und das klappt nicht. Die erste Hürde ist geschafft. Der Chatpartner schöpft keinen Verdacht. Dann gehen wir einen Schritt weiter. Haro alias Matthias schickt ihm eine Datei. Ja, so, he sends a, uh, a file. So what could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Does he open it? Does he open it? What do you think? Ja? Sein Gegenüber öffnet das Dokument ohne zu zögern. Gefährlich. Im Fall eines echten Betrugs könnte es sich um einen Virus handeln. Richard tappt in die Falle. Das ist bekommen. Jetzt habe ich es bekommen. Ja, yeah, so he received the file. Everything is fine. Ja, <lacht> yeah, so um, we made some other experiments. Why not earning some money? Funktioniert der Live-Deepfake sogar so gut, dass wir den Chatpartner dazu bringen, dem Spendenaufruf zu folgen und Geld zu überweisen? Willst du auch was spenden? Willst du mitmachen? The question to you, hands up, who thinks that he will transfer money? Wow, that's a lot. Okay, let's have a look. Um, uh, the solution was, it was what it was removed. The solution was he um, uh, just transferred the money. He so actually did, yeah. <laughs> You know, it sounds like fun, but these are real existing attack vectors. We have the possibility with Zoom meetings, with video conferencing in times of a pandemic or post-pandemic, where, where nearly everybody's working remotely, I don't know. You can do phishing scams, data breaches, hoaxes, everything. <laughs> like, you know, identity theft, financial fraud, and so on. And if you think, this is just fun, it isn't. There were many, many cases um, where uh, money was transferred, not only 5,000 uh, uh, pounds, British pounds. Um, some other scams, uh, uh, of course, uh, happened as well. So now the question is, when we um, communicate with a person uh, which is much more far away, a friend, a, you know, a far friend, but what happens if you try to fool the parents? Let's have a look to this one. Hey, Papi! The money. Hello, dude! You're bist du schick, Junge. Hör mal, Schätzchen, was ist denn mit den Kindern los? Den geht's super. Ich bin halt gerade bei der Arbeit. Aber den geht's gut. Alles perfekt. In den ersten zwei Minuten merkt keiner etwas. Aber dann wird Matthias' Mutter plötzlich stutzig. Yeah, so uh, Haru Füllgrabe was calling Matthias' parents and the first two minutes everything was fine. But then something happened, so um, she just recognized there is something... Yeah, does not fit for her. Dein Gesicht ist so fremd. Mm. Sie merkt, dass hier etwas nicht stimmt. Seht ihr mich doppelt? Bist du da? Das, das, das bin ich. Du hast ja erkannt, dass ich das nicht bin, oder? Ja, du sahst ganz fremd aus. Ich sehe durchs Telefon, wie es dir geht. <lacht> <lacht> tschüss, Danke, tschüss. bis bald. Ciao. Liebe Grüße. So, and this brings us now. How can you spot a deepface? Thomas. So, uh, when spotting a deepfake, your first line of defense is always suspicious behavior. So if someone acts suspiciously, uh, you should be really careful about that. Because... Um, yeah, normally uh, this could be a sign for a deepfake. 
There's also some technical uh, things that you can consider. So for at least at the moment, we have uh, things like a low level of skin detail, so that the skin doesn't look really natural, or other distortions, which we just saw in the previous examples, uh, or a lack of emotion if there is, if the smile doesn't look that perfect or not that natural or uh, artifacts around the, he uh, the head because we have these in-painting artifacts which you saw previously and so on and so on. It can be uh, broken down to everything that looks a bit unnatural because deepfakes really have a hard time when it comes to hair, when it comes to teeth, when it comes to the facial expression. So these might be good signs that you're talking to a deepfake, but these are of course under construction. So at the moment people are working on creating the perfect deepfake which you cannot distinguish anymore. And with that, this brings us to our conclusion because um, as you can see, the only thing that is really there that will be there tomorrow as well is suspicious behavior. Yeah, so if you get a FaceTime from Obama, maybe just, just, just <laughs> think for a second. All right, yeah. to the conclusion, Martin. Yeah, let's go. We've seen let's a lot go of quick. different we don't deep have much time. over yeah. the years. So today you learned the evolution of um, deep fakes. Uh, everything started with Deep Face Lab, and uh, um, yeah, nowadays there is Deep Face Life existing. It can do real-time face replacement. Uh, yeah, the TNG deep fakes they can replace the whole head, as you learned today. But they're not open source. Yeah, they are not open source. That's very important and. Um, in 2019, we predicted with our first deepfakes talk um, uh, that it could happen that this is interesting for the movie industry. So you might ask yourself why. Let's have a look to this video snippet. So please guess which one is CGI generated and which one is created by a deepfake. Three, two, one. So the bottom part is a deepfake and the other part is a CGI. Now imagine what, the, what it means if you just uh, burn some electricity uh, to generate a fake video material for cinematic productions. Um, it just costs less money than CGI creating that stuff with, with the CGI, which is very, very high, um, uh, means very high efforts to create something like that. And our predictions came true. So there was this guy on YouTube creating um, deepfake Star Wars video snippets, which just looked so cool that he's now an employee of LucasArts. Yeah, doing deep fakes for a living, that's the dream. And yeah, now and now, nowadays you can earn money while you sleep, right? Yeah, let's look at something completely different, because here we have a telecommunications ad from Russia, and you can see we have uh, Bruce Willis in this ad. The thing is, he was never there for the shoot. So Bruce Willis was basically just probably sleeping at that point in time when this video got shot, and he just licensed his face to be deep faked and earned a couple of bucks with that. So how cool is that? <laughs> and now we've seen the good, we've seen the bad. Let's have another look at the ugly. So of course, whenever a technology like this comes along, it's going to be used for fake news and propaganda of whatever sorts. And yeah. This is basically why we're standing here today and why we want to talk to you about this topic. Deepfakes are just going to be a thing now. They're not going anywhere. And if we want you to take anything home with you today is, well, if you see a video like this, maybe think twice before acting. And we also want you to spread the word about our dope deepfake video. We have a <laughs> QR code up here. You can scan that and then you can see me basically in a, a TV show and the Terminator movie and even a yoga movie why ever you would want to see that. We don't judge. Um, but check it out. It's pretty dope. Uh, and with that out of the way, that's kind of all we have to say. So if you found this interesting, um, make sure, can, can, can people rate the session right here? I guess they can. If you can rate the session, do it. And if you <laughs> found this interesting and want to work with us, uh, please let us know. So that's everything that we have. We also have a bunch of talks that we uh, like older talks, and that's our faces right here. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so this was our very first time in Sweden giving a talk about uh, yeah, technical stuff. And uh, thank you. Uh, for being with us and if you have any questions uh, we will be around here and yeah, uh, yeah. because we're kicking getting kicked out right now. yeah we, we are getting getting kicked no out right now we right time. we have yeah? some time okay all right do we have yeah? okay maybe do we one? have some questions
Da, there is a question. Here, there. Yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> Are you or is someone building a predictor to, you know, please, this is a deep fake? That is a very good question. Deepfake prediction is, has been a big topic in the last couple of years, and we've been approached by a bunch of people who wanted a deepfake predictor built, uh, or a deepfake detector. And we've done something a little bit similar in the past. We've built a, a prediction uh, or a detector for so-called cheap fakes. And our big learning there was that, well, once people have this kind of technical silver bullet, they tend to just shut down their heads and just like toss things at the software and be like, okay, if the software says no, then it's safe. And that doesn't really work because you can still have a manipulated video that doesn't feature a deep fake. And if you have a system that tells you um, it's not a fake, then people are going to believe that and stop thinking about it. Because what we talked about previously was um, the way, the, the number one way to detect a deep fake is to look for suspicious behavior. And if you do so and you find that this might be a little bit fishy, it's weird that Obama would say things like this, well, then maybe do your fact checking and then you'll find most of the time. Um, a good yeah, thing to, so I, to spot a deep fake is, by the way, the quickest way nowadays, I would say, is just um, to ask uh, um, the attendee in the call, for example, um, to move his hand over the face like this. And then probably the illusion will break very quick. But for now, yeah, yeah. For, for now, for, for no. Now. And um, we had one technical thing that might work for our deepfakes in this case. And uh, you might have seen the discriminator uh, uh, in the GAN uh, training. And the discriminator might potentially detect if this is a real image or if this is a deepfake. But again, this is just for our implementation. So if somebody trains something completely different, then this GAN won't work for yeah. us. This discriminator will not work and uh, we will ha have the same challenge again. So we have a cat and mouse game and whenever somebody comes up with a perfectly working deepfake detector, then somebody else will create a deepfake that will, won't be detected by this yeah. detector. So that's our answer, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? I think we had one up there. Uh, question. Uh, same question, okay. okay. A different question, uh, here is one. <laughs> Like, what if someone has a, a tattoo on the face or a scar or like a deformation? Will it show? Will it like still render the picture of the person? Maybe like Mike Tyson or will it be hard? No, that will actually work. So the, the, the main bottleneck that we have is basically does the face detector work? And we found that you have to do pretty horrible stuff to your face for the face detector not to work anymore. It's very robust. It works for pretty much any single person. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, no, if you have a scar or a face tattoo, in most cases, that won't affect the deepfake at all. Yeah, you could they even have things, ugly things in your face like um, glasses, glasses yeah. or things like that, and they will also be reproduced. So you can take off your glasses and still have glasses on. So this but is if you train it with valid. both variations, you can take the glasses off and the deepfake will also don't have the glasses then. Yeah, also works. <laughs> I Other question. Okay. There was one question up there. Uh, last question for today, because then everyone has to go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go. You to have to eat. <laughs> uh. Oh, that's pretty high. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is Thomas' workout for today. For for the month. <laughs> <laughs> what is the real feedback that the discriminator gives? to the producer? Is it, I can imagine it's easy to give a binary feedback, this is fake, this is real, but what, how does it help really improving? You cannot really say, oh, it's lacking color or... That's a very good question. And to answer that, we probably have to jump a little bit too far into the rabbit hole of how neural networks are trained that I'm willing to, to go right now. But the, the basic answer is, so we don't have like a binary yes or no thing. We have more of like a float value between zero and one, which is more of like a percentage. And uh, the feedback that the discriminator gives to the generator is basically that value. And what the, um, what the generator will do then during training is take a derivative of the entire discriminator and basically know what's going on inside, what causes it to say that. And that is basically the feedback. And we kind of try to um, break it down to Martin saying, well, there's color in there. No, Thomas saying there's color in there. So it's, it's rather complicated, but 
Um, what the discriminator really gives you is a value between 0 and 1 that tells you how fake or how real it is. All right, with cool. this, uh, Jonas, we have one more thing, right? We have one more thing if you don't want to go to lunch, but then we're <laughs> getting kicked out. Yeah. Um, so we want to show you one more thing. Uh, let's uh, see. Yeah. So this you set it up and uh, we tell what it's all about. Yeah, so this so is a preview of uh, maybe next year's talk. Um, we created an AI, or several AIs actually, that are capable of uh, creating perfectly valid slide decks. So we don't have to write our slide decks on our own anymore, but we can just give in the basic topic and everything else will be created. It will be even narrated by the AI. And yeah. So you can create a presentation for a conference just within three minutes. You just yeah. give the topic and everything works out. Let's see. Do we, it's do based we on GPT, is, is stable diffusion and stuff like that, you name it. And uh, so how do we spot deepfakes? Is, 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 is it what we want to, to show? How to spot? There it is. I, where Go is up. It? Where is no, it? Go up. Uh, a little uh, bit. In the middle. Up, 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 up. Stop. Yeah, stop. Oh, yeah, there, there, there it oh. is. So oh, this is a completely artificially generated presentation with GBT, stable diffusion, you name it, and let's start. No, that's boring, let's do uh, uh, Okay. <laughs> let's do, uh, yeah, because we're in Sweden. Do it yourself surgery, no, a new trend. No, let's do this one, that, that one's great. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, <laughs> why not? Good day to you. I'm the TNG Technology Consulting PowerPoint Karaoke Generator, but you can call me Kevin. Today we're gonna talk about the important topic, day drinking in Finland, a primer. In Finland, it is common to start <laughs> drinking around noon and continue until late into the evening. This is known as day drinking and is a part of the Finnish culture. Starting with a light beer or cider, people will then move on to stronger drinks such as vodka or whiskey. Day drinking in Finland is seen as a way to socialize and celebrate with friends and family. It's also seen as an important part of Finnish life, to be able to enjoy yourself in moderation while spending time with loved ones. Day drinking in Finland is an ancient tradition that has been passed down through generations. It is a cultural practice that is deeply rooted in the Finnish way of life and has been around for centuries. Day drinking is part of the national identity, and it's a way for Finns to socialize and enjoy their time together. The tradition of day drinking has been preserved, even as Finland modernizes and evolves over time. It's a unique custom that will continue to be cherished by Finns for many years to come. When day drinking in Finland, it is important to follow a few key rules. Taking regular breaks between drinks and avoiding hard liquor during the day are essential for staying safe and healthy. Consuming too much alcohol can lead to dehydration and other health issues, so it is important to drink responsibly and take regular breaks. <laughs> Additionally, hard liquors such as vodka or whiskey should be avoided during the day due to their high alcohol content. By following these guidelines, you can safely enjoy the traditional Finnish pastime of day drinking. Thank you for listening to this presentation about day drinking in Finland. All right, primer. so now and you know. If you have a topic you want to get generated with our iSlides.com, just drop a message on Twitter or a mention or something like that. And maybe we will create that for yeah. you and yeah. send and you the link. The All link right. is, uh, or if you want to enjoy some more of the presentations, it's ai-slides.com. Yeah. All right, enough advertisement. Thank you so much, Taksumike, okay. for your... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>